actually get a thumbs up on the iPad screen. Yeah, yep. it, we, can, we see can see it. Okay, great. Um, we had been considering this um, circuit um, for decoding Hawking radiation. Um, and the basic concept was that Alice um, throws her qubit into this black hole here, which is represented by some uh, unitary operator that should scramble um, if it's a black hole. Um, and Bob um, can attempt to decode this information um, if he has another um, identical black hole that he has entangled with Alice's via a shared EPR pair. Um, and the general protocol involves um, projecting uh, these two qubits that are <clears throat> shared between the two black holes um, onto an EPR pair after the scrambling um, operation. Um, and roughly speaking, we gave an example um, of how um, at least sort of the classical information could end up over here um, in the case where this was not a, a completely scrambling random unitary, but just a C naught gate. And the intuition that we had um, at the end of, of last lecture was that um, we could arrange a situation where the only way that these two qubits would end up in that EPR pair that they started in, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, would be um, if either both of these control qubits um, were 0 or both of them were 1, because we need to either flip both uh, qubits or flip neither qubits in this EPR pair for it to end up back in the same state. So that was kind of the intuition um, uh, for how this process of projection um, can kind of um, uh, essentially conditioned on that projective measurement, we can have information that was previously here in Alice's state end up over here um, in, in Bob's possession. Okay, um, so maybe questions about where we stopped before I kind of show an example of an experiment. So just to have the intuition uh, right, so you can decode the information that comes out of Hawking radiation as long as you have another black hole to help you with. It, yes, but you said you can, mm -hmm. right? You can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you uh, can. Exactly, which, um, uh, it, yeah, which needs to be entangled with the first one, which you can do by sort of having this EPR pair um, mm -hmm. that's split between the two. Um, okay, okay, thank you. And, and so an important point about this was that um, how, with what fidelity you can do this decoding depends on how well this scrambles. And in the one example mm -hmm. I gave where it's just the C naught gate, it kind of does the right thing in, in one basis. Um, the fidelity um, will be, um, where did we write that? So the fidelity would be high um, uh, for just like if it happens to be a zero or a one, um, but for a generic qubit, it's not perfect. Um, but if this scrambles, then kind of irrespective of the basis, um, this, this can teleport well. And so the neat thing about this is um, we said sort of the probability of projecting onto the EPR pair um, will go down and actually is a measure of the out of time order correlator um, it, it, it decaying. Um, but measuring something decaying in an experiment is sometimes um, not sort of a smoking gun for scrambling because there are lots of sources of decoherence that can make things decay. And so a nice thing about this protocol um, is that you can actually see have sort of a, a positive signal um, which is uh, uh, that actually this fidelity um, increases. And so now if I, um, actually, I wonder, let me see whether I can do this directly on my, if I can do this on my iPad, I don't have to switch screens. Okay. Um, so there were now a few different um, experiments that, uh, or two experiments in particular um, that use this protocol in either trapped ions or superconducting qubits. And um, I'll just show um, some examples of the measurement that was done in this trapped ion system, um, where essentially um, they have, um, this is kind of what their experiment looks like. There's this chain of, in this case, seven ions that they did this demonstration with. Um, and they can um, sort of locally address them with some laser beams in order to implement um, these gates. Um, similar to things I've talked about before, the way that they have their, their qubits interact is via sort of the motional mode. So there's some Coulomb interaction, and they can have the motional modes mediate um, interactions between, between their ion qubits. Um, okay. And so in this case, um, this is the, the circuit they built. They actually have um, kind of three um, qubits uh, going into each of the black holes. 
um, but actually just projecting on one pair here. Um, so this is sort of the pair, right, that starts out as an EPR pair, and they project onto this, EP, this again, onto, do a projective measurement and ask, conditioned on finding this in an EPR pair, what's the fidelity of teleporting um, Alice's qubit to here? Um, and they can also ask, what is the probability that they, in fact, this projective measurement succeeds? Um, and so they actually do kind of a comparison of what happens if they have a scrambling operation, um, which is, that's kind of illustrated here in blue. There's some unitary involving these three qubits. Um, and the degree to which it scrambles is parameterized by something they call alpha. Zero would mean not scrambling, one would mean scrambling. Um, and you know, I won't go into the details of what, what's in this circuit, but you can imagine there's a way of tuning sort of how, how random this is. Um, the other case that they consider is something where they sort of want to do an identity operation. So we gave that example last time, right? We said, if um, U is the identity operation, then um, uh, the teleportation uh, is no better than just randomly putting some quantum state here, 50% um, fidelity. So they, they sort of make an identity operation, but they want to actually allow for sort of see what would be the effect of kind of experimental imperfections. Um, so they make a, a fancy version of the identity operation. So it turns out if, if you, um, uh, in addition to sort of doing nothing, <laughs> um, if instead of doing nothing, you do an X rotation on one qubit, a Z rotation on one and a Y on another, um, that actually should end up being equivalent um, um, to the identity operation um, if there's no rotation. But if there's a small rotation, then this could actually kind of, this is sort of mimicking some sense of decoherence. Um, and so um, if, so when they do this experiment, they can ask what is um, the fidelity of decoding um, and what is the probability of actually measuring. So what is the first maybe so what is the probability of actually measuring this EPR pair to be in the state it started in? And the second one is conditioned on getting that measurement outcome. What is the fidelity of the decoding? Okay, so the probability is shown on the left. Um, for these two cases, the one that's sort of an imperfect identity operation, um, sort of the, as we increase theta along this axis. Oh, you could you also have this little toolbar uh, hiding the slide. Okay, so as we increase um, theta, can I point and not have the toolbar out of the way? Okay, no, sorry. Um, okay. Um, I think you can see what I'm talking about. So if I talk about the left image, um, as they increase this mismatch parameter theta that says how far is it from the identity, um, the probability of successfully um, measuring uh, the desired EPR state goes down. And that's actually a measure of this out of time order correlator. But this isn't because of the scrambling in this case, right? It's just because of some um, imperfection in the, uh, some, some decoherence, essentially, some imperfect operations. Um, but also, um, the, uh, and, and similarly, as they increase the scrambling parameter in the left plot, right, um, they also see this probability go down. And so the point here is it's not so easy to distinguish the scrambling um, from the imperfection just from seeing some quantity decay. So in the right plot, um, they instead look at the fidelity of the decoding. And there, not surprisingly, if you just have this sort of imperfect identity operation, then it's always sort of just 50% uh, fidelity, which is what you would get if you randomly guessed a quantum state to, to put into, um, uh, into qubit seven. Um, but if they actually have an operator that scrambles as you increase the amount of scrambling kind of by ramping alpha from zero to one, they see the fidelity of this teleportation um, go up. Um, and so that's um, here, this increase in fidelity um, shows that this isn't just decoherence causing this correlation function to decay, but it really is, it, it really is the process of scrambling. So that's kind of a neat um, like positive signature um, uh, that, first of all, a neat a positive signature of the scrambling, but also kind of a toy model demonstrating this idea of decoding the, the Hawking radiation. Um, so yeah, and so this has now again been done in a couple of different physical systems. I see someone hiding their video. So um, is there a question? Uh, you answered my question. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, good. So again, so this is kind of you know it's a it's a few qubit system. There was the question earlier. You know, can't you calculate this? Yes, you can calculate it. 
Um, but nevertheless, actually having sort of the level of experimental control to do this with even just a few qubits um, is sort of really an important starting point for asking, you know, could you scale this up? Could you do this also with sort of more complex um, many body systems? Um, one thing you might want to do, so, so far in this experiment, we said that kind of the um, entanglement between the two black holes um, has the form of um, an infinite temperature thermofield double state, right? So the thermofield double would be each state looks um, thermal, but um, the state of the entire system is pure. Um, one of the things you might want to be able to do is also study, for example, finite temperature systems. Um, and so one other thing that's kind of an, a nice experiment that was recently done um, in this same group, um, which is the group of Chris Monroe, um, was to demonstrate how you might go about preparing um, things that essentially this type of a thermofield double state. And the approach that they take is, um, so I've written this down here, right? So um, maybe you would like to prepare two entangled copies um, uh, of uh, that, that look like they each have effectively some temperature beta, right? So these are just different eigenstates of the system. Uh, J, J labels the eigenstate of the system, E sub J is the energy. Um, and um, if I had a state like this, then each kind of copy would look thermal by itself, but the state as a whole is pure. Um, so this is an experiment where, okay, each, each um, uh, copy of, it's two copies of a three qubit system, right? There are six qubits in total, so um, not a huge system, but um, what they are able to do is actually initiate the system in a set of EPR pairs that realizes kind of this, the infinite temperature version of this, um, right? Um, uh, beta is zero, um, but then they can actually kind of cool this state. Um, and the way that they cool the state is actually they implement kind of a variational algorithm, which is to say they have, um, so right, this is their initial state. Um, these kind of bonds here are indicating EPR pairs, right? So this is one copy. This is another copy of the system. They're entangled. Um, so this sort of says, okay, so we start with this infinite temperature thermofield double state. And then they have some um, sequence of, of gates that they can apply. Uh, and without going into too much detail here, the basic idea is that um, if you have some kind of parameters you can vary in this subsequent circuit, um, you can try to kind of steer the system to a lower energy state. Um, and so this is sort of a hybrid quantum classical algorithm where um, you implement some circuit here. You can measure, if you, you know, do multiple repetitions of the experiment, you can measure the expectation value of the energy, um, uh, which just has, in this, sorry, I didn't, in this case, it's, it's, an, it's an, a transverse realizing model. They can measure the expectation value of the energy by looking at essentially spin correlations. Um, and then they can feedback, change their variational parameters um, and optimize this circuit um, to try to bring it to kind of a lower, uh, to, to effectively a low temperature state. And so that's kind of one approach that's being um, explored to saying, could you sort of um, implement these same types of protocols, but with finite temperature states? Um, questions about that? So I have I have a question. Why, yeah. why can't you just um, sorry, I'm a theorist, but can't you just like compute what you should put into what parameters you should put in and then just put those in? I Absolutely. I guess I'm confused yeah. by the feedback on this. Yes, yeah. For for three qubits or six qubits for the double system, you can. So I think the point is more the point is more if you wanted to scale this up to a regime where you can't compute what parameters would take mm -hmm. you. To the state, mm -hmm. you could nevertheless you can nevertheless measure the expectation value of the energy um, because that's just like if my Hamiltonian is just sum over i j um, j i j sigma i sigma j um, plus h sum over i sigma x sub i or something right I have this transverse realizing model and I can easily measure the expectation value of the Hamiltonian by doing implementing the same circuit a bunch of times. And looking at correlation functions, right? I need some two-body correlation to measure the energy, the Ising component and the interaction term and the average magnetization along X to measure the transverse field term. And so then I can basically um, yeah, steer myself towards lower energy that way. So that's basically the concept. And that idea is, I mean, that idea comes more from the sort of quantum computing um, direction. So how do you maybe solve some optimization problem that's encoded in an Ising model? Um, and that's this is known as the QAOA algorithm in that context. And here they're using it um, 
actually they did a couple of things in this paper. So they used it to prepare um, low energy states at a critical point um, in this model, um, but also to prepare this thermo field bubble state. So, okay. yeah. Cool, other questions at that point? Okay, um, so this is kind of, yeah, it's sort of like using a quantum computer to, to do this. And there's another sort of, you might wanna ask, is there sort of a more, a way that's not sort of implementing these very um, specific quantum gates? Um, and it turns out that it's been pointed out, I mentioned this, I think in answer to a question earlier this week, that actually quite generically, um, if I, um, oh, actually, sorry, I wanna switch to this first. So if I, it's, if I have kind of a system where I have, let's say two systems that are identically prepared, um, and they're kind of coupled to each other. It's actually very natural to end up in a situation where if I have you know, unitary evolution, um, each half of the system um, alone looks thermal, but the entire system is in a pure state. Um, and so that, so it turns out that it's actually fairly natural in systems that obey what's called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, that sort of typical eigenstates locally look thermal. Um, it's actually very natural that this type of a state would kind of arise um, even without kind of implementing a quantum circuit to make it. Um, so this is actually an example of an experiment um, that was done with um, ultra cold atoms trapped in an optical lattice. And so here they, there are basically six atoms um, optically trapped and they can um, hop between sites. And if they're both on the same site, um, these are bosons, and if they're both on the same site, they will have some interaction. Um, so this realizes a Bose-Hubbard model. Um, and in this experiment, it was actually possible, and, and I'll say in a moment how, but it's actually possible um, to measure um, entanglement entropy or Renyi entropy um, uh, um, as a function for, for subsystems and to ask kind of what is um, the entropy of, of this subsystem or a larger subsystem. So this is a plot basically um, of the entanglement entropy, or, or sorry, the entropy of a subsystem as a function of the um, size of the subsystem that you select. And so if you select the subsystem to have size zero, then the uh, entanglement, uh, sorry, the entropy is zero, um, not surprisingly, but also if you take the entire system, that's this point over here, um, then the entropy is zero because it's, it's prepared in a pure state, essentially, um, to the best of experimental capabilities. And, um, but if you cut it and you look at the entropy for some subsystem, um, like for example, half the system, um, that's higher. And okay, the gray line is indicating what it would be for a thermal state. It's not precisely thermal for the half cut, but it's still kind of approximating something like this. Um, if you sort of think of each half of these systems, the, each half is sort of in, in, let's say, an approximately thermal state without doing any sort of fancy preparation. It's just having these um, um, coupled sites of a Hubbard model. Um, so one thing that's, I think, kind of cool about this is how do they actually um, do this measurement where they're measuring the um, Renyi entropy of the system. Um, because quite generally sort of, uh, you know, the fact just being able to measure um, entropy, measure entanglement entropy is something um, that, you know, it's something that's convenient to calculate, but not actually so easy to measure in experiments. Um, and so just to be clear, so for example, if I take this, um, uh, this half cut here and I ask what is the Renyi entropy of one side of the system, that's telling us about um, also entanglement entropy between the, the two halves. So how do they do this? Um, actually, does anyone here know how they did this or have an idea how you could do that measurement in this experiment? No, okay, fine. Um, so let me just show kind of a little bit more of a picture of, of what they do. So it turns out this is again, something where they take advantage of being able to prepare two identical copies of a physical system. So that turns out to be kind of a powerful trick. Um, so they start in this case um, with uh, an, an array of, again, it's, it's an optically trapped atoms that's prepared in a Mott insulating state, which is um, a, a, due to the influence of interactions, the atoms sort of organize themselves um, in, a, in a situation with one, a single atom per site. So that's just a way actually of preparing a nice clean system with one atom per site. Um, and uh, they have some control over the depth of the lattice that's separating these atoms. 
Um, so that gives them the ability to sort of partition the system and think of, let's say, a row as an independent system or to actually couple two rows. So that's an important tool here. Um, so in this case, they kind of initialize this as two independent chains of six atoms each. Um, and by lowering the lattice step, they kind of quench on tunneling. So the atoms can start to tunnel between sites in each of these copies of the system. Um, and then their trick for measuring entanglement entropy in this system um, involves essentially doing some interference between these two systems. So turning on, so freezing the dynamics um, along the chain, but actually turning on a coupling between the two chains. Um, and that's kind of illustrated here, turning on a coupling between the two chains. Um, okay, and that interference experiment where you interfere the two copies of the system um, can give you information about entanglement. So to give kind of a flavor of how that works, um, let me actually um, just write for a moment. Um, um, so the intuition kind of is that, um, so they have, you know, the experiment, they have, just sketch this one more time, they have these um, two chains, each of them has six sites, they should be identical, I'm not good at drawing them, so they look identical, but imagine that they're identical, um, and uh, That. And as to kind of get a sense of how you can measure something about entanglement in the system, it's useful actually to first think about a really simple example. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to turn on um, kind of pairwise couplings between these sites um, to interfere the, our two copies of the system. It's kind of you, so essentially I can think of this as if I call this system A and this system B, um, I'm going to turn on, um, so to do an interference experiment, I'm going to turn on for a suitable time, a Hamiltonian that looks like sum over um, sites in the system, let's call the sites I, um, uh, AI dagger, uh, B sub I plus AI dagger. So this is kind of, uh, right, so this is hopping between the two systems. And this is the same as actually a beam splitter, right? I have my bosonic atoms. It's a little bit like taking, um, for each of these um, uh, sites here, it's a little bit like taking two photons and putting them on a beam splitter. Okay. And so now, um, we, so we could draw it kind of like, like this. I have some mode that I'm calling A, um, which would be um, the zonal one, a mode that I'm calling B. So I can do sort of a mapping to a case where I have um, two photons incident on a beam splitter. And so just sort of as a question, um, imagine that I had exactly one photon incident on each port of the beam splitter. So like my psi in is um, one in mode A cross one in mode B. So this would be an example of an unentangled state that I could, um, uh, so, so this this would each sorry each site. Let me say that again. This would be a case where um, each site is in a pure state. Um, so again, these two ports are representing two sites that I'm interfering. Each one is in a pure state. Um, can anyone tell me what I would get out of the beam splitter in this case of the two ports of the beam splitter? So, like my input state is these two ports. Anyone know um, what the output state would be? You're not all quantum optics people, so I don't, I mean, yeah. Um, so in the field of quantum optics, there's something known as the Hong Mandel effect, which is that actually the output, um, so I evolve for a suitable time under this Hamiltonian to implement this beam splitter operation. The output is going to be um, that I have exactly two photons out of one port and zero photons out of the other. So I either get um, both photons out this port or both photons out that one, and I never get one and one. Um, is, this, is this something you've seen before? You can convince yourself, you can do the algebra and convince yourself. Um, but this is kind of a neat fact about um, uh, <laughs> bosons subject to this type of a beam splitter operation is that if I look at um, the number of photons out of a given port, um, in this case where it's one and one, I, I always get two out one and zero the other. But more generally, um, if I send 
essentially, if I send the same um, clock state into the, these two ports of the beam splitter, um, you're actually always going to get even parity of the photon number out of each port. So you're never going to get an odd number here and an odd number there if the input state is pure, actually. And so it turns out that the parity, um, it turns out that the, uh, so if I define like the parity um, as the like minus one to the number of photons um, in one of the ports at the output, um, this parity operator is actually a measure of the purity of the quantum state that went into the beam splitter. If I have even parity that indicates a pure quantum state, um, if I have odd parity, the only way that can happen is if I had a mixed state. Um, and so actually just by measuring in, this in their experiment, just by measuring um, interfering these two systems and measuring, um, do I have an even number or an odd number of um, atoms at the end in one side, they can actually, and so they can do that in many experiments, they can measure the expectation value of the parity, and that directly gives them a measurement of the purity of the quantum state, and they can do that for a single site, or they can do that for some subsystem. Questions? So if we go back to this picture, um, this actually allows them to see that, um, for example, if they, uh, uh, so they can look at the, the parity for the entire system, right? Um, and even parity, uh-oh, flipped by accident. Um, even parity would mean that the entire system is pure. Um, and more generally, and the expectation value of the parity then tells them how pure this state is. Um, and that's then closely related actually to the um, second Renyi entropy. Have, did you all talk about entanglement entropy? I think there were some things in Slack. So I think we talked about entanglement entropy. So the second Renyi entropy exactly is sort of a first approximation and the bound on the entanglement entropy. Um, and they can get that um, directly by measuring the purity, which is trace row squared. Um, so yeah, and, and so this gives a way of um, seeing these things like that the system locally um, uh, uh, is in a mixed state, but globally is in a pure state. Um, so that, you know, okay, so it's, it, it's maybe worth mentioning. Um, so this is one really kind of, I think, really elegant way of measuring entanglement. Um, it's uh, something that you can't sort of do in, you know, necessarily in every kind of physical system, because again, you need to have these two copies. Um, so one other kind of approach that's been taken in a couple of experiments um, goes um, back to this idea of using sort of randomized measurements. So earlier, uh, last time we mentioned something about using randomized measurements as a way of probing um, um, the out of time order correlation function. Um, but also um, in similar experiments, um, it's been possible to basically have something where you have just a single copy of a system. Um, you let it evolve under time. Um, and then you perform some sort of a random operation before you measure, which basically is a way of kind of measuring in, in some randomized basis. Um, and so in that kind of randomized basis, you can ask questions about what are the correlations between the probabilities of different measurement outcomes. And that actually is an alternative way of being able to um, quantify uh, uh, entanglement. And so this is, or quantity as a, to get a measure of, um, uh, of, yeah, of entropy and entanglement. And as a result, actually similar things have been done with this type of measurement scheme um, in systems of trapped ions, where um, like in uh, this picture here, you can kind of see, this is again, something where they have now a chain of 10 ions. Um, they can see that for zero ions or all 10 ions, the um, entropy, the Renyi entropy of the system is, is quite low, um, but um, at some intermediate point um, where they cut the system in half, the entropy is higher and that's um, quantifying the entanglement of the system. So, um, and you can be fancier and ask questions about mutual information between the two halves. These are all things you can then get out of this type of measurement. Um, so I, I think this is kind of neat, this, the, this sort of toolbox that's developing for me directly measuring entanglement in, in quantum systems, um, partly because I think it would be really awesome to start to explain, ex connect this to some of these ideas um, about entanglement being related to geometry. So I'm not aware of this being done. 
Um, but I, my understanding is that um, in cases where you have a system with a holographic dual, um, there's a connection between uh, uh, entanglement and the, the boundary system um, uh, and, and um, uh, the area of um, some curve in the bulk, um, I guess length in this, in this picture that's drawn here. And so I, I kind of wonder, are there situations where you can have um, a system at a critical point um, that might be described by a CFT where you would expect to be able by measurements of entanglement to kind of learn something about this um, bulk geometry or verify something about this picture. So I don't know if anyone here thinks that's um, um, interesting or useful, but it seems to me that this is a toolbox that maybe could be connected um, more to gravity. Can, can I ask a question about yeah. that? So you showed, I, I think it was maybe your first talk, Mm -hmm. where you did these really cool experiments um, where you had um, these uh, these kind of spin chains that you could create a geometry out of. Yes, yeah. Um, so I was curious if, I, I can't remember if you said you had been able to realize some kind of um, like a, a, a hyperbolic geometry, so something like ADS, you know, it seems like that yeah. would be a really great place to try to do exactly this experiment you could try to use some of those techniques that you just discussed on the previous page and actually you know in the lab verify some of these formulas yeah so maybe i can briefly i mean i think what i can briefly say is we so what we realized was something um i'll just sketch for a second so i don't have to switch um um to my laptop but we realized something where we had a physical system um in which the structure of interactions was such that um, roughly the correlations were well described by thinking of the sites of our system as leaves on a tree graph. Um, right, that's right. And the argument was that tree graph is, is something like ADS because the depth is, is log n if the size of the system is n. Um, and so, and in this system, we were, you might recall, actually probing um, some spin correlations in order to kind of reconstruct that this is kind of the, this graph is a good picture of the bulk geometry. Um, yeah. And we even kind of did some measurements that where like the ideal thing to measure would probably would have been entanglement and entropy, but we don't easily have access to that so far in our experiment. Uh, at least we haven't we haven't um, sort of worked in that direction. Um, but um, we did something very coarse, which is just measuring like a correlation function, um, sort of by part uh, correlation function between the total spin on this half and the total spin in that half, for example. Um, and the interesting thing to me was that actually even those sort of coarse measurements looked similar, fairly similar, at least qualitatively, to theory for what the entanglement entropy should look like. Um, the, there are, yeah, and so, but I think actually sort of directly measuring entanglement entropy to be able to direct more connect, connect more directly um, to, I think, to holography seems like it could be an interesting direction. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I actually, this is, I'm just going to mention <laughs> while we're on this note, that one of the things I've been kind of curious about is to the extent that there are sort of other measures that signify entanglement in experiments, um, um, are those useful? Are those useful or not? So, for example, one thing that I like to think about is sensitivity of a system to perturbations can actually tell you something about entanglement and the number of particles that have to be entangled, um, because there are fundamental limits to how precise a measurement you can perform without entanglement. And so, entanglement enhanced sensitivity can, uh, yeah, uh, enhanced sensitivity to some perturbation can be a witness of entanglement and a quantifier of the depth of entanglement. That's not something that is maybe as often connected to these ideas of geometry. Can it be connected? I think there might be a little bit of work on that, but sometimes that's the more natural thing to measure in an experiment. So, to me, that's kind of potentially an exciting direction is connecting sort of other witnesses of entanglement um, to, to geometry if that's possible. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so good. So this is just, I don't know, maybe trying to inspire you all <laughs> to think about what should we be measuring um, with this toolbox. Um, good. So I had this very ambitious plan for the week. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I talked a fair amount about uh, uh, measuring information scrambling. We've now talked about measuring entanglement. And one thing we've seen is that actually some similar tools are useful for both having two copies of a physical system um, that you can interfere with each other or that are entangled, um, having the ability to perform kind of random unitaries. Um, uh, uh, those are both um, sort of valuable tools that have been applied to some of these topics. 
Um, and we talked about teleportation for decoding Hawking radiation. Um, a couple of other things I promised to comment on um, were, um, you know, so far this is kind of adopting this holographic approach to connecting quantum information um, with, with gravity or taking ideas from gravity to understand quantum many body systems better. Um, there are a couple of other approach approaches that are being explored in the lab that I at least want to sort of touch on. Um, so I thought I would say a little bit about, um, just kind of highlight some recent experiments that look at um, analog gravity. So for example, can you um, realize Hawking radiation in an analog system where you have an acoustic black hole um, and um, precision measurements. So I'm just gonna kind of touch a little bit on ideas that are out there and things that people are doing um, just to give a, a flavor. Um, so yeah, so we talked about sort of the right the quantum information approach to thinking about um, uh, Hawking radiation. The qubit um, uh, gets scrambled. Can you unscramble it? Uh, can you decode that information? Um, it's worth pointing out that there are other experiments um, which are um, pursuing a line of research that was first proposed by Unru, which is basically can you realize acoustic analogs of Hawking radiation? Um, uh, in the form of, uh, of phonons um, in some kind of a fluid. Um, and in fact, one can even do this in a quantum fluid by using a Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, and so this is, there's a series of experiments um, that were done over the past few years in the group of Jeff Steinhauer, um, where he essentially um, prepares a Bose-Einstein condensate um, in a potential which has a step in it. Um, and actually um, by, he can also kind of accelerate the Bose-Einstein to condensate by moving its trapping potential. Um, and this actually, this sort of acceleration um, against this step um, gives rise to something um, that looks like a horizon. Um, and this is something where um, they can actually see um, some excitations that they interpret as, as Hawking radiation, um, which uh, essentially um, can form some kind of patterns in their Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, these patterns have to do with, um, I guess there's kind of a picture drawn here um, of these excitations kind of bouncing back and forth between an inner and outer horizon. Um, and so by looking at um, essentially correlation functions in their um, density, density correlations in this condensate, um, they can um, uh, sort of probe this analog of Hawking radiation. Um, and there have been various kind of, um, uh, as I said, there's a series of experiments that they've done where they ask things like, um, can we probe the temperature of this analog Hawking radiation? Um, can we actually probe entanglement between um, the Hawking radiation and um, entangled partners. Um, and again, this is all by sort of measuring correlation functions in the Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, so this is, um, I just kind of want to sort of um, mention if this is a line that's of interest to you, there's a nice sequence of papers by Jeff Steinhauer um, that, that goes into that. Um, in kind of a slightly different approach, also employing a Bose-Einstein condensate, um, there was the idea can you study um, the Unruh effect? So um, have something that looks like uh, uh, an accelerating reference frame that gives, gives rise um, to uh, Unruh radiation that's analogous to Hawking radiation um, um, at an effective temperature that depends on the acceleration. Um, so can you mimic, can you realize some version of that effect? Um, and the sort of rough approach that was taken here was that if I have a scalar field in an accelerating reference frame, um, then um, one can show that that's sort of equivalent to having um, time evolution under a Hamiltonian that involves creation and annihilation of pairs of excitations with opposite momentum. Um, this is the um, non-rural radiation. And they kind of are able to actually realize this Hamiltonian by having a Bose-Einstein condensate with an interaction strength that can be dynamically modulated. Um, and I think there's kind of um, beautiful pictures that they take um, where as a result of this modulation that allows them to engineer this Hamiltonian, um, if they look sort of after some time, um, take an image of the density of atoms, um, they see these kind of jets um, emanating outwards 
um, which are coming about from these, this sort of creation of, of pairs of excitations of, of opposite momentum. Um, and they can actually analyze things like the statistics of the number of particles in these jets to say something about their effective temperature and relate that to the um, acceleration that they have um, simulated by kind of engineering this Hamiltonian. Um, and let's see. Um, and, and they even actually, one kind of neat thing that they're even able to show is that they can reverse this process. And so it really kind of shows something about um, the coherence of the process. Um, they can actually um, sort of evolve backwards in time by changing the sign of their Hamiltonian and see that this sort of these outward emanating jets um, actually start to kind of go back into their, their central cloud. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, kind of a totally different approach that's not the, um, you know, connecting quantum information um, uh, or, or thinking of sort of a black hole in terms of uh, uh, a scrambling operator and, and qubits, um, but asking more, um, in this case, can you kind of engineer a Hamiltonian that looks like this field that's in an accelerating reference frame? Um, uh, okay, so that's kind of one other experiment that's going on in the group of Chen Chin. Um, I'll just pause here. That's kind of all I wanted to just give a flavor of these things um, so that if you're interested, you can look um, at them in more depth. But I'll just pause here and ask whether there are any um, questions about that. Okay, so the last thing that you might want to do is kind of directly probe um, uh, quantum gravity by precision measurements. Um, and here, um, I mean, generally the challenge is having systems that are both massive and somehow behaving quantum mechanically. Um, just to give a flavor of sort of ideas that are out there, um, one thing that's been proposed um, is to test for sort of modifications to the commutator between position and momentum. Um, that are proposed various, I understand that various types of modifications are proposed in a variety of different kind of theories of quantum gravity. Um, and so the idea is, can you sort of do a precision measurement of this commutator um, in order to check, is it really IH bar or are there some correction terms that might depend over, let's say the, um, the momentum over the um, Planck momentum or, or um, uh, 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 with some kind of parameter that says how strong is this correction, right? Um, and to kind of give a sense um, in this, this proposal um, for sort of starting to probe this type of thing, they pointed out that like any bounds on these are actually extremely loose um, based on any current experiments. Um, so this if this beta parameter is kind of, um, uh, uh, or, so, so basically if this beta parameter is large, um, that basically means that these uh, are kind of very small modifications, right? Uh, sorry, did I say that right? If there's a, this is, so roughly you would like to be able to get to this beta parameter being of order one. Um, and right in the experiment so far, you're sort of 30, uh, 30 orders of magnitude away. Um, and so, uh, so I said it backwards, sorry. This beta parameter being large means you would only be able to detect an extremely large modification, right? So to be able to detect, detect something that's sort of on a natural scale um, for Planck scale physics, you would want to be able to have this beta parameter be order one and be sensitive to it. Um, okay, and so roughly this is a modification to the commutator would also be some modification, of course, to the uncertainty relation between position and momentum. Um, and so roughly the kind of concept here is actually um, well, if you had um, some kind of a massive system that you could um, displace around, um, let's say, some loop in phase space. Uh, so here it's some loop and uh, position and momentum. Then if you can do this with some ancillary system, um, which is light, actually, in this case, what you would like to do is some kind of interferometric measurement that actually allows you to measure the fact that there's a geometric phase associated with um, undergoing this loop in phase space that actually depends on the commutator. Um, so that's kind of the general concept is that the, the commutator dictates a phase that would be picked up when you sort of drive the system around this closed loop. Um, and the idea is if you can use um, light um, to do this, 
So you, you need to kind of have a sufficiently strong effect of this massive system from the light field. Um, and ideally the massive system should be in its ground state, right? So that I can kind of um, uh, uh, probe a relatively small loop with a small effect from the light. Um, then the idea is basically that I can do an interferometric measurement on the light field that generated that loop in phase space and detect some phase shift of the light that tells me um, something about this commutator, right? So this is kind of, this is the phase space of the oscillator. This is the phase space of the light. Um, and the light would pick up some phase shift um, as well as some squeezing um, that um, is sensitive to this commutator. So well, that's not an experiment that's been done, but I think it's kind of an example of, um, first of all, sort of thinking creatively about what, what could you do to really try to get into a regime with what looked like somewhat realistic parameters um, to be sensitive to um, um, testing theories that would modify the commutator. So it's also kind of, this is an example of the type of proposal that's motivating people to work on getting um, massive systems into um, a, a well-controlled kind of quantum regime. Um, and there's been kind of, you know, a flurry of different experiments um, over the past kind of 15 years or so, trying to take massive objects and get them to um, kind of lower and lower temperatures, closer and closer to their quantum ground states, and in fact, into their quantum ground states. Um, so, and there's kind of a wide range of physical systems that people work with, um, ranging from, um, uh, you know, small, um, fairly light uh, little membranes, um, all the way up to um, the mirrors of LIGA. And so, um, so this is actually a plot that um, I actually, the reference will be on a subsequent slide, um, but this is taken from a recent paper that actually cooled um, the differential motion of the LIGO mirrors down um, from you know, room temperature um, all the way down to an occupation of 10 phonons. Um, but they, they also kind of show a sort of an array of like, what are the different physical systems that have been cooled sort of towards the quantum regime or that have been cooled particularly using effects of optically sensing the mirror motion and either via coherent feedback induced by the light field or by some um, external feedback based on a measurement using the light field, um, cooling down the motion of the mirror. Um, I just, for myself, I kind of made a, a, a line of the Planck mass because I thought maybe that's an interesting um, uh, reference scale. Um, so um, a couple of things that have been done here. I was actually, I opened this paper and I was shocked that it showed an experiment that I did as a graduate student, which was really just um, actually cooling the center of mass motion in a cloud of atoms, um, but using similar techniques to what some of these experiments that are using that are trying to cool more massive objects. Uh, I was amazed that that even was worth mentioning on this plot because we have other ways, uh, we have other ways of cooling atoms. Um, but um, yeah, so what is what are the kinds of approaches that people are taking? Um, here's an example of an experiment that um, somebody actually mentioned on, on day one of this week. Um, where uh, this is from the group of Marcus Oslemeyer in Vienna. And they are working um, currently with sort of um, little nanoparticles um, on the 100 micron scale, um, developing some techniques that they hope you know, can also be scaled up for potentially to um, even more massive objects. Um, but the basic idea is that they optically levitate a microsphere um, and they cool it using a technique known as cavity cooling. Um, so in my field of sort of laser cooled atoms, the sort of standard cooling technique relies on the fact that atoms have very well resolved spectral lines. Um, here you have this, you know, this big bead, it's kind of a messy object. Um, um, although we take care to have it be a high quality factor mechanical oscillator. Um, and what you can do is have something where essentially um, it's optically trapped. So you can kind of think of it as a harmonic oscillator that has some you know, quantized energy levels. Um, and what you would like to do is sort of drive some process with light that preferentially lowers its energy in this harmonic potential. Um, and the trick that they employ um, is to have the beads trapped inside an optical resonator. Um, and they can Draw, let me actually um, draw kind of a separate picture for a moment just to kind of illustrate um, kind of what they do. So they have, um, this is the sort of, there's some resonance associated with this optical cavity. Um, and they have a laser beam that is tuned away from resonance 
by um, essentially this um, uh, vibrational energy of the harmonic oscillator. So the idea is that what you would like to do is have a process where you absorb kind of a lower energy photon from the laser and emit a higher energy photon. Um, so that means you would like your kind of laser field to be tuned um, to the red of this resonance by an amount that is, um, I guess in this case, they call it H bar omega X. So that's the, they're trying to cool the motion in the X direction and omega X is the trap frequency in that direction. And so the idea is then um, because of this resonance feature, the atom will preferentially, not it's not an atom, sorry, the, the um, feed will preferentially emit a photon that's of a higher energy than the light that they're sending in. And so they do this and the, they send in light, the photons get scattered into this resonator, overall higher energy photons get scattered in. And so um, correspondingly, the energy sort of goes down this ladder of oscillator states all the way into the ground state. Um, okay, and so that's one way that you can start to get um, a somewhat massive object into its quantum ground state as they did in this paper. Um, at kind of another extreme, um, or, or sort of an, an even uh, higher extreme of mass, um, there's a very recent result using um, LIGO actually. Um, actually, I'm curious, so I know you had lectures on gravitational waves this week. Um, I don't know whether there were more on the theory side or the experimental side, but presumably LIGO was at least mentioned. <laughs> um, did you talk much about how LIGO works or a little bit? Uh, okay. I, yes. think, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, so, more, so, more so I figured you could at least um, see LIGO. So, um, and so here, um, they have a, effectively a 10 kilogram oscillator. Their oscillator, they define some mode that's kind of the differential motion of the mirrors, right? Whatever, what LIGO is, is sensitive to. Um, and uh, they're basically cooling that, um, that motional mode. Um, it has an effective mass that's 10 kilograms. Um, and I, I mean, quite amazingly, they're able to cool this from room temperature down to 77 nanokelvin. So it's just, you know, the mirror isn't at 77 nanokelvin, but the one relevant um, motional mode is at, at 77 nanokelvin, um, which corresponds to having just 10 phonons worth of, of energy in this mirror. Um, and you can imagine this is, this is hard, right? I actually should have, um, I wish I had, I guess we can kind of see it here. So the displacement sensitivity they need sort of on a time scale of a second, they need to be able to measure the displacement of the mirror to something on the order of um, 10 to the minus 20 meters, right? So um, extremely precise measurement. And there are so many things that go into this um, from having basically, um, a, so, so what do you need to do? First of all, sort of you need lots and lots of light because otherwise you'll be limited by just the statistical fluctuations and the photon counts that you get, right? So they send in a high power laser. They also have um, the ability to kind of recycle the power to amplify how much power they send in even more. And then they have these res resonators in each arm of the interferometer to build up the power yet, yet more and to amplify kind of the information they get out in the phase shift of the light. Um, and then on top of that, as you perhaps learned um, in some discussion of LIGO, they squeeze the light um, to reduce that measurement imprecision that you get from the statistical fluctuations um, e even more. Um, and so with all of those ingredients that were just developed even to detect gravitational waves, it's now possible to detect the motion so well that they can feed back on it and cool it down um, to this extraordinarily low level. Um, so I think there are kind of different, um, I can imagine there are different things you might want to do with different physical systems ranging from really massive mirrors to something like these little beads. The little beads, there's the hope that you could kind of um, prepare them, let's say, in a quantum superposition of two different places and directly do interferometry with this massive object itself. Um, or something like the proposal I said, I pointed out before, measure the commutator using light that interacts with the quantum system. And maybe that's something that can also be done um, in LIGO, although they probably have um, <laughs> other more pressing things on their mind. But um, yeah. So although I guess, yeah, actually, so once you have a, a massive system like this that's in the quantum regime, um, you know, building some additional interferometric measurement to probe it um, maybe is not so crazy. So, um, so I think I, I'm kind of amazed at just the progress that's, you know, been reached here with this um, huge object being so close to its quantum ground state. So um, I think things that sort of seemed crazy not so long ago in terms of having massive systems in a quantum regime are becoming um, closer and closer to reach. Um, so one last thing that um, I'll just mention from um, uh, 
uh, the field of cold atoms is that you know atoms are not um, uh, Planck mass objects, but they do have a mass. Um, and they can be used to perform kind of exquisitely sensitive um, measurements by creating them in, so here it is possible to create um, quite a large quantum superposition of an atom in one place and an atom in another place. Um, and so that's another approach that's being employed um, to say um, you can basically use a pulse of laser light um, to place an atom in a superposition of, um, let's say, staying where it was or getting a momentum kick in some direction. Um, and so here's kind of an illustration of actually an uh, apparatus in the lab of my colleague, Mark Kasevich, um, who has a 10 meter tall tower where they do these types of atom interferometry experiments, kind of um, have an atom that is tossed in the superposition of um, being here and being tossed up. Um, and uh, they can get to the point where actually by having kind of multiple momentum kicks um, applied in sequence, um, they have atoms that each individual atom is basically in a superposition of being one in one place and being half a meter higher up. Um, so that's kind of a, a pretty big separation for an object with some mass. Um, and uh, this is kind of, uh, there are some measures of sort of how macroscopic is the superposition that have to do with both the mass and sort of the, the distance scale. Um, and um, depending on some kind of parameter that folds in both of those, um, one can, uh, if you can kind of coherently recombine and, and see interference, you can rule out certain theories of whether gravity might cause superposition states to collapse. Um, I, I can't say much about how well motivated those theories are, but they're definitely out there. Um, and this type of experiment um, is kind of a, a neat way to, to, to test and, and, and rule them out. Um, um, also being used for things like if you have two different masses of your atoms, you can test the equivalence principle that have recent work on that. Um, so yeah, um, one other kind of system for probing gravity with quantum computers. So with that, um, I guess I actually went faster than I thought I would because we're kind of, we still have a few minutes for questions, but maybe that's good. Um, so yeah, I've kind of, just to sort of summarize, I've shown these different approaches um, to exploring um, kind of the intersection of quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, I spent a fair amount of time on kind of the simulation approach that's inspired by the holographic principle. Um, can we um, study, uh, you know, black holes through the lens of entanglement um, and more broadly investigate this concept of um, uh, gravity or space-time curvature and geometry emerging from entanglement. Um, we gave a sort of very brief overview of um, what's going on in, in analog gravity, um, acoustic analogs of Hawking radiation, um, for example. And then we touched on precision measurements. Can you really directly probe gravity um, in, and quantum mechanics in the regime where they both matter um, just by exquisite control over massive objects and high precision. Um, so with that, um, I will stop and take questions. Thanks a lot, Monica. Let's uh, thank Monica for the wonderful set of lectures. Um, yeah, so we got plenty of time for questions. We, we also have a Q&A uh, tomorrow. So Oh, you can save your questions for then. Um, uh, yeah, so but let's see if there's quick questions now. Um, for the uh, slide where you showed the experiment of the commutator, measuring okay. the commutator, for that first that slide. A, sorry, just a quick comment. That was a proposal, and it's not an experiment that's been for, done. Go ahead. Oh, OK. OK, never mind then. Yeah. That already answered the question? <laughs> The question was where the data point is on that like left hand plot. Uh, um, I, I think the slide before. Yeah, yeah. So that was, and and I guess they kind of thought about like you know how how well has this been ruled out so far, and the answer is not very well. Um, but yeah, it's it's not an experiment yet, and I showed it kind of just to motivate um, what's something you might do once you have these kind of well controlled massive systems in the quantum machine. Okay. Thanks. Do you do you know the theoretical framework that gives them this commutator? Sort of hard to. No, yeah. unfortunately, I would. So if you um, look at their paper, they actually have probably at least three different possible um, models for sort of the form in which the commutator might be modified, um, mm -hmm. and you know they scale in different ways, um, and uh, they and they reference a whole bunch of papers on which you know what type of model would predict what type of um, modification, but no. Um, 
that's something um, where I would refer you to this paper um, for okay. more detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although maybe I'm curious, does anyone here know? Yeah, does anyone here know? I, I do not. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. it's just, I'm skeptical. I, I'm a little skeptical of the claim that this parameter is so weakly constrained because you know, I'd have to see the theoretical framework to see what predictions it makes and whether, whether there are actually some other predictions that are completely in conflict with the experiment. But knowing nothing, I, I shouldn't really say anything. Just... Yeah. I don't know what the theory is behind it, but I, oh, sorry. I, I just looked up, some, there, there's some recent 2020 paper where they say the form of this uh, beta expression is like highly sense, is uh, important basically. Some of them don't get a, a minimum length scale and some of them do. So I'm sure they accounted for that in this paper, but yeah. Okay. It has to do with the minimum length scale is the, the basic. Idea, I see. I don't, I don't uh, know I see. Okay. All right. So then, yeah. Oh yeah, and I guess actually this plot, I think was kind of getting at that, that somehow, um, uh, like the standard commutator would set one minimum length scale and that would be modified because of the modified uncertainty relation on understanding that correctly. Yeah. Mm. One other thing I wanted to say, just kind of while you're thinking about your questions, um, a bunch of you put really interesting questions actually into the Slack chat um, during the first lecture. And um, I have to admit some of them I understand and some of them I, I said, oh, I'm going to have to like read up on that term um, <laughs> to even understand exactly what the question is. Because as I, as I warned you from the outset, um, I know more about the lab than about the quantum gravity side. So, um, uh, but I will try to take another look through that list and see whether that might um, uh, raise some interesting topics for kind of discussion tomorrow. Um, and I would also be happy if any of you want to maybe yeah. elaborate a bit on some of the ideas that you put there, because I think that could be a lot of fun. Um, that's, a, that's a great idea, yeah. And part of, I will say part of sort of what I was hoping by sort of being in the summer school um, is that uh, I, I feel that somehow there, there are opportunities for dialogue between those of us who do experiments and those of you who kind of think deeply about, about the theory. And unfortunately, it's really hard to kind of know, <laughs> know both sides, right? And so um, even just sort of developing a common language and under, for you all to sort of understand something about what's possible in experiments now, where are they kind of moving and what might be possible um, soon, hopefully that gives you an opportunity to kind of think about um, what should they be doing? Because we might not know, right? Where we spend so much time just building the tools um, that we don't get to think about the deep questions as much as we do. So. So uh, I'll ask a question. So uh, I think many of the experiments that you showed, um, uh, roughly speaking, had you know some number of qubits of order maybe six or uh, something like that. And and then you know, sort of the NISC era is meant to be qubits of order sixty to one hundred. Uh, is is that just you know experiments have uh, are waiting to catch up, or there's some fundamental issue with going to the, to, to 60 or 100 qubits and doing, um, doing these kinds of experiments in, in on that system. Yeah, so I think um, there are different physical platforms that we can talk about. Um, one of them that's maybe a good example are superconducting qubits, because there I did show one experiment that was 53, uh, and that's on kind of, you know, Google's state of the art platform where they also did their quantum, their famous quantum supremacy experiment, right? So um, that's kind of, I think, in the regime that you would call this NISC era. It's kind of just that regime where um, it's hard to calculate things or impossible or you can argue about how many weeks it would have taken to calculate the thing that they did or years right, or right. eternity, yeah. but so it's definitely in that regime. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, I guess the issue is, you know, Google has that processor and they have one and <laughs> um, other, you know, uh, I, I think that will start to probably become more common, but obviously that was a huge effort to, to build and there's not a lot of, um, uh, there's kind of um, not a lot of platforms that are at that stage right now, right? So, so other people who don't quite have the Google processor, um, nevertheless, um, you know, can do some smaller scale things. Now, of course, actually, the, I think, um, yeah, and there was one example I gave from the Berkeley group with superconducting qubits. I didn't go into detail, but they did one of these decoding the Hawking radiation type experiments with just a, a small system. So yeah, I think part of it is just that um, uh, the 
even in this NIST era, the, the, the sort of state of the art tools are re really there are just a, a few kind of um, experimental systems that are at that level. Um, in trapped ions, um, I showed some experiments in chains of like six to 10 trapped ions. Um, and there, um, scaling those up, these so those chains have um, sort of they have very good high fidelity operations. Um, it turns out that there are just challenges in terms of the electric fields that you need to sort of make a longer chain and still have it be not buckle and things like that. Um, so there's definitely work going on on that. They also think about modular architectures where you can have several sort of units and they, they're connected to each other in some way. Um, I think state of the art is probably on the order of 50-ish ions, but that's something that most of these kind of more physics-y experiments are sort of, let's use the system that's sort of well-developed that has six to 10 ions. Um, and I would probably the larger systems are more focused towards like really what do we need to do to turn this into um, the best quantum. Right. So, so you, then, you kind of, oh, sorry. sorry, I want sorry. to mention one more platform, which is neutral atoms, um, which I think is some, something where there's really been rapid progress just over the past few years um, in uh, array. Let me actually, sorry, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna switch to my laptop again, just so I can show a pretty picture. Um, which I probably showed once before, but um, screen, keynote. Um, so I think somewhere I showed some pictures of, oh, this isn't even the best one. Okay, well, um, here we go, yeah. Um, pictures of arrays of, of neutral atoms. Um, these are 1D arrays, these are 2D arrays, and the state of the art that I didn't show here is probably like maybe 300 atoms in an ordered array. Um, and the state, and they also have very high um, gate, two qubit gate fidelities. And so these are, and they're, sorry, the approach with these systems um, where you have these atoms in individual tweezers is you excite them to Rydberg states. And those um, sort of when, when, when they're excited, they have a long range interaction so that neighboring tweezers can kind of talk to each other. Um, so that's a system that is very scalable and um, they've shown, um, again, quite high fidelity gates. It doesn't have the issue of ions where it's sort of hard to make a bigger system because you can arrange it in 2D and that naturally sort of gets to hundreds. Um, I can't, i sorry, I can't see anything on your screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I must have, it says I'm sharing, but I must be sharing the wrong thing. So let's just try that one more time. So we do um, play in window. And then I need to share the window in which it's playing. Can you see it now? OK, yeah. So yes, just showing yes. these ar yeah, arrays of neutral atoms. And so that, um, I would say, for some combination of kind of fidelity of the operations and scalability just has really been taking off as a, as a very promising, exciting technology. Um, so this would be for doing kind of spin type models. And then if you want to do something more like Hubbard type models where you have either bosons or fermions hopping in a lattice, um, uh, then um, that's also possible with large numbers. Um, the one example I showed of sort of Hubbard model physics was this measurement of entanglement entropy. And that is the problem that um, the sort of fidelity of that measurement goes down exponentially in system size when you do this, if you have any imperfection, this inter in, uh, interference between the two copies um, has an exponentially decaying fidelity. And so that's what, even though they can make quite low entropy, large systems and look at them at the single particle level, um, this example of looking at entanglement entropy with two copies, that would be hard in a large system. But there are other, and this is again, where sort of thinking about what are the observables, are there simpler observables, correlation functions that can reveal some of the same physics, are there interesting things to look at um, in terms of like a system like that or at a critical point connecting, you know, is, is there a um, situation where there where there's some connection um, to ADS CFT? I think there might be some opportunities there in a regime where you can't calculate things, right? Yeah, okay. So so you kind of think it's a matter of time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. A couple of years, maybe. What's yeah, what's the time frame? <laughs> um, maybe the question is for what? So if you say what you want, what exactly you'd like to see, <laughs> then <laughs> well, uh, okay, yeah. this um this teleportation experiment uh, uh yeah. with, with more more than three. Cubits. Yeah, I think that's probably a matter of time. Um it's sort of like um again, they measured um, things like the 
the scrambling of this 53 qubit circuit, right? Um, they, in that case, I mean, actually you could imagine in a system like that, they probably could make a set of entangled EPR pairs and then do something um, um, something along those lines. Um, again, it's probably an issue of um, kind of priorities. Priorities, they, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. They might <laughs> rather like implement the quantum algorithm than <laughs> right, right, right. Sure. study so, quantum yeah, algorithms. We'll, we'll wait think, until... yeah. Yeah. We'll wait until they move on to the next system and then, then yeah. use that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very good. So <laughs> great. And any last questions? Any other questions? So if not, again, I'll, I'll look some more at your, your comments from day one um, as sort of maybe a starting point for discussions on Friday. So yeah, please, please bring um questions and ideas of you know what might be cool to do in future experiments and i hope that we'll have a nice discussion tomorrow okay thank you very much monica yep bye